Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Uh, I start my talk with the name of Allah Almighty, the most gracious and the most merciful. I am very much pleased to be here, and I am sincerely obliged of giving me an opportunity to present my talk in front of you. So the topic which was assigned to me that how the electrophysiologists take care of cases of proximal supraventricular tachycardia. So here we have a female, 24 years old female. Uh, she was absolutely normal. She was enjoying her birthday party and all in sudden she complains of tachy palpitations. She was alert, awake. When she was brought to the emergency, she had normal hemodynamics and her blood pressure was absolutely normal. Now the first question in the emergency, how will you approach this kind of rhythm in the emergency? What's the underlying mechanism of this irregular wide complex tachycardia? Once the patient is young, having structurally normal heart with normal hemodynamics, that's the key. So the same ECG with a zoom up view, there is no doubt that the patient is having irregular wide complex tachycardia. Now the differential diagnosis lie between polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, atrial fibrillation with any kind of pre-existing bundle branch aberrancy, and the third one, and the, there's the very rare one, pre-excited atrial fibrillation. So there are some clues and you have to use them in a systematic way to make the diagnosis in the emergency and that has an impact on its short term and long term management. You just have to concentrate on the bipolar limb leads and the unipolar precardial leads and the rhythm strip. If you just concentrate over here that there are some QRS complexes that appear to be very wide and some of the QRS complexes they appear to be narrow and there are some QRS complexes they are having the width in between wider than the narrow QRS complexes. So the QRS complexes have varying QRS morphologies as far as the depth is concerned. Once we look at the rate, the shortest pre-excited ventricular rate that approaches to more than 300 beats per minute. So this is the pathognomonic of this kind of irregular wide complex tachycardia in the ECG that how will you rule out the other causes and you, you are sure that the underlying diagnosis is pre-excited atrial fibrillation or uh, you can say the atrial fibrillation in a setting of Wolf-Parkinson-White Wolf syndrome. So now the question is why we have this kind of ECG in the emergency, what's happening in the heart? Now we know that the atrial rate during atrial fibrillation approaches between 300 to 600 beats per minute. But we have a structure that lie between the uh, upper chambers and the bottom chambers that is known as AV node. And the beauty of the AV node is that it has a decremental properties. It means that it will never allow the atrial rate of a 300, 600 beats per minute to traverse anti-gradely and to allow the ventricles to conduct with the same rate. So what's the normal ventricular rate during atrial fibrillation? That's between 150, 180 and maybe up to 200, but, with, but it will never be more than 200 beats per minute. And it's all because of the decremental properties of the AV node. So what will happen once the patient is having abnormal anti-gradely conducted accessory pathway? Suppose here there is an abnormal connection. So now again the ATR rate is between 300 to 600 beats per minute. Now there are two anti-grade routes. The one is the normal one. So once the impulse will traverse through this route, you will find the narrow QRS complexes. But once it will traverse anti-gradely through the accessory pathway, and we know that it's an inefficient conduction, muscle to muscle conduction that will give rise to very wide QRS complex. And any QRS complex that's in between the narrow and the wider one, the fused one, it means that part of the ventricle has been depolarized both through the AV nodes and the Hispercongia system and the accessory pathway. That's the reason in such kind of patients in the emergency, in the ECG, you will find three kinds of QRS complex morphologies and they all are the pathognomonic just to make the diagnosis that the patient is having pre-excited atrial fibrillation. So again, the same ECG, now you know the mechanism. 
wider one, narrow one, and some are the fused one. But the, the ventricular rate between the wider one, the shortest pre-excited one, that's approaching to more than 200 beats per minute, almost 300 beats per minute. It's a pathognomonic for those patients who landed in emergency, normal young patients without any structural heart disease, that the patient is having pre-excited atrial fibrillation. And it's very, very important to make the diagnosis. Why? Normally, we don't have other antiarrhythmic drugs in the emergency. And you know that the AV nodal blocking drugs, once you will offer those kinds of drugs in this kind of patient, they are the fast killers. It means that you have blocked the AV node and all the atrial impulses with a rate of 300 to 400 beats per minute, they will conduct through the accessory pathway and will degenerate into ventricular fibrillation. And it can happen with the IV imiterone. And the question is why it will happen with the IV imiterone. We know that, broadly speaking, amiodarone is a class 3 antiarrhythmic drug. But it's actually a multi-channel blocker. It has both, it has class 1, class 2, 3, and 4 antiarrhythmic effects. We know that the antiarrhythmic 2 effect is actually a beta blocking effect. And the 4 is the calcium channel blocking effects. And we don't know the pleomorphism and the genetic of the patients. Once this mechanism will dominate the beta blocking and the calcium channel blocking effects of imidarone, it means that you are allowing all the atrial beads to conduct anti-gradely through the accessory pathway and the atrial fibrillation with a rate of 300 to 600 beats per minute. Now the ventricles are contracting with the same rates and that's the rate of ventricle fibrillation. So that's the reason it's a class three recommendation just to give imidarone in a patient who's having pre-excited atrial fibrillation in the emergency because of this effect. So it's the second case. Sometimes at a broader look, once you will look this kind of a case, it's very, very hard to say this is a case of pre-excited atrial fibrillation. You may be trapped by these narrow beads just to say, okay, it's a monomorphic VT with a capture bit. No, you just have to look all these ECGs in a very, very close fashion. And here you can clearly appreciate that here the, the, you can clearly appreciate the irregularity as far as the RR interval is concerned. And you just look at the ventricular rate, that's more than 300 beats per minute. So it's very, very important to know what's the underlying mechanism apart from where the accessory pathway is and what's the ultimate solution of this. So what's the concept of delta wave and the pre-excitation? We know pre-excitation is the propagation of depolarization wave front that occurs more quickly. Accessory pathways are very happy to conduct all the impulses. They have all a null principle. Due to the presence of accessory conductive pathway that bypasses the normal conduction system. And it's the classical representation of a uh, initial slur that is known as delta wave because this part of the ventricular is depolarized through the accessory pathway, not by the normal conduction system. So classically, you will find short PR interval delta wave prolonged QRS interval of more than 120 millisecond. Now the question is, why these patients are having atrial fibrillation? As Dr. Zahur was mentioning, it's entirely different from the mechanism of the adult atrial fibrillation, where we have heterogeneous uh, atrial fibrotic tissue in the presence of reentrant drivers, rotors, multiple wavelengths, and repetitive uh, atrial firing pulmonary vein triggers but these patients are normal. They are having normal, structurally normal heart. So there are two mechanisms which were proposed to cause AF in WPW. One is related to accessory pathway. That is known as accessory pathway dependent. And the other one is intrinsic atrial vulnerability. We know that it's actually an embryological fault in the formation of AV valve ring. That's the reason any tissue that's close to the accessory pathway that's abnormal. And there is dispersion in the effective refractory period. And in some patients, it has been found that the increased intra and intraatrial conductual delay led to atrial fibrillation in these patients. Now, how will you treat this case in emergency? Pre-excited atrial fibrillation? And it's true for all the patients who present with tachyarrhythmias. If they are hemodynamically unstable, you will directly go for sedation and a synchronized cardioversion. That's not particular to pre-excited atrial fibrillation. That's true for all kinds of PSV, T, uh, tachycardia and all, ventricular tachycardia and pre-excited atrial fibrillation. But once the patient is hemodynamically stable, as the patient, as our patient, okay? So now you have the IV ibutalide and a procainamide. Unfortunately, we don't have these antiarrhythmic drugs in our setup.
And the other one, that's a 2B recommendation, you can offer flaconide and propafenone. But if they are ineffective, you will go for synchronized cardioversion. But the question is, what will the solution for our patient? That's hemodynamically stable, I mean, and we don't have all these kinds of antiarrhythmic drugs in our emergency. You just have to counsel the patient, go for sedation and synchronized cardioversion. That's the only ultimate solution for such kind of patients in emergency, rather than to put them in the IV imidron and just to wait whether, they will, uh, whether these patients will improve or they will degenerate into ventricular fibrillation. So what are the other kinds of tachyarrhythmias? They are associated with Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. The one is ORT, orthotromic reciprocating tachycardia. If the entry grade limb is using the normal AV node and the hypercongestive system and the retrograde is accessory pathway, then the term is known as atrioventricular re-entrant tachycardia. Sometimes you will not find an evidence of the pre-excitation on the ECG and the term is used as concealed accessory pathway mediated ORT. And if the anti-grade limp is used by an uh, anti-gradely conducting accessory pathway and the retrograde by the normal conduction system or another pathway, in that situation you will find the wider QRS complex tachycardia in the emergency and that will be monomorphic. And the term is used as atrioventricular re and in tachycardia antitromic. So this is the ECG, narrow complex, regular tachycardia. You can clearly appreciate the P waves. That's known as long RP tachycardia, and the patient was found to be having left free wall accessory pathway mediated ORT. And this is the ECG of a patient who is uh, uh, using accessory pathway in an anti-grade fashion. That's the left free wall. That's the reason you will find a classical atypical right bundle branch morphology. Wide complex tachycardia with a positive concordance because the accessory pathway lies at the base and the axis will be inferior, right bundle with inferior axis. These are the three kinds of arrhythmias which, were, uh, which are associated with accessory pathway. The most dangerous, uh, the most dangerous one is pre-excited atrial fibrillation. The others one are ORT and ART. So this is very, very important. Once we will take these patients in the emergency, we will just measure the pre-excited atrial fibrillation, what's the pre-excited RR interval, because it means that the accessory pathway is having robust conduction, and that's an independent predictor of sudden cardiac death, especially in a patient who is having Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome on the ECG. And there are many papers, reports, and literature. They are comparing the ECG-proven pre-excited shortest RR interval with the ECG. Which is my last slide, I know. Dr. Amir is coming just to tell me that the time is over. So these are the ways we, where we deal such kind of patients in our lab. Is, this is actually the transeptal catheterization, anti-grade route, just to deal these kinds of uh, left free wall mediated accessory pathway through the transeptal. This is the SRO sheath and this is the ablation catheter, which was positioned close to the left uh, tricus uh, mitral annulus at 3 o'clock. And there are various maneuvers in the EP lab just to know where the pathway is. And just within one to two minutes, you, you will get rid of and you will lead to permanent destruction of the accessory pathway through radio frequency energy. And this is another retro aortic route just to deal these kinds of accessory pathway. And this is the latest modality which we have that is known as 3D electroanatomical map. And it's very, very important in a way some patients are having Epstein's anomaly. And it's very, very hard to map the mitral as well as the tricuspid annulus in those cases. And it will precisely catch the tricuspid annulus and you can clearly position your catheter and it will add the stability and as well as fluoroless. It will minimize the radiation exposure. And it has a very, very high success rate, especially in those patients who are having Epstein's anomaly, structurally abnormal heart, multiple accessory pathway. And the same is true if the site of the pathway is within the CS, that's known as epicardial accessory pathway. So now in these days, we have all kinds of conventional as well as the 3D guided radio frequency ablation facilities in our setup to deal these kinds of uh, cases. So that's my last slide. Pre-excited atrial fibrillation is the mode of sudden death in WPW, maybe the first clinical presentation. It's a class one indication to take these patients for the ablation. Significant decrease in AF after successful and permanent WPW ablation and the incidence was reduced by 76 to 91%. And this is a takeaway message for all of you. Early referral of all SVT cases is important just to get rid of this disease because it has a curative treatment. Thank you very much.